So good morning, my name is Jez Wayne. I work at Atos, based out of Grenoble. Uh, the good news is I'm the last thing between you and lunch. The bad news is this is the first time I've given this presentation, so uh, I absolutely know how long, no idea how long it's actually going to take, but we'll see how we get on. There's a lot of material. I do tend to talk quickly. Please, <laughs> please uh, tell me if I'm going too fast. So, not so long ago, Power and X86 were like oil and vinegar. They never, ever could mix. And, and in truth, if we look a little bit back at what we just heard the, this morning in the keynote, uh, th this is the true face of the world. We're up against X86 very clearly in the X86 world today. Uh, when people think of cloud, machine learning, uh, open source databases, the first reaction is, to, is towards X86. And I think this is one of the key roles of the Open Power organization is to, uh, to, to promote the power as a, a viable platform as an alternative against x86 today. And uh, I hope I, with what this I'm going to present to you, I can uh, make you come to this same conclusion. And I am keep harping on to IBM about this and what we should be doing in this space. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why they never really mixed. And of course, there was the, the first religious war of the Kis Risk and Kisk battles. But much more importantly was the second religious war which is about the big engine and little engine, uh, which of course comes from Gulliver's Travels and Lilliput, and this was so the uh, the Befescu and the, the Lilliput, which was an uh, analogy for England and France. I'm an Englishman living in France, so I'm very familiar with this sort of war. And then the big engine and little engine was an analogy on the Catholics and the Protestants. So this is what we're talking about <laughs> here. Uh, so it really was a religious war. And the problem with the, with the data format is that uh, if you went onto the big Indian model, then you, you're in a data lock-in because you, 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 all your data, your application data, was in this format and it wouldn't go off. It was, you couldn't get out. You know, you're, once you've got your database or your wh whatever application, your ERP was running on a big Indian system, then getting it off was a big job. Yeah, and it usually wasn't very compatible. And so there's this lock in into uh, the platform, which of course customers, which was great to start with, and, my, and IBM, excuse me, IBMers, but made a lot of money with this lock in story in the past, but uh, now it's no longer acceptable and we need to be open and we need to move things. But the big thing was, ever since this outset, power, uh, the power architecture was ambidextrous. It can do big engine and little engine. Uh, and it can do big engine and little engine at the same time. This is what's really smart about this platform. We can run, uh, oops, we can run, uh, where are we here? Something's gone wrong with my picture. So we can run AIX, which is a big engine operating system, and uh, Little Engine Linux on, a power, on the same power server, and uh, the hypervisor will switch the operating modes on the fly, and, and it just manages that, that context change. But because we're doing now running Little Engine, that means that the little Indian Linuxes that we can use uh, are exactly the same as the little Indian Linuxes that are running on, on x86. Okay, so th what just as a little anecdote here, you see that the little Indian little li little Indian Linuxes are always done EL, yeah, which is EL for little Indian, and this is the big Indians having a dig at the fact that the little Indians have got everything backwards because the the ordering of the the numbers is back to front, so e you'll see EL when it should really be EL, L-E, sorry. So uh, when we on a same endianness, of course we're having the same uh, data format on the, on the underlying system, which means that we can have the same application data format. Yeah, it means that the, the applications that are running on our, on our systems are the same using the same data format on x86 as they are on, on power. And the example I wish to talk to you about today is uh, with uh, Postgres. Okay, so it means that we can have a Postgres application running on x86 right into the database files. And that th those database files are perfectly readable by uh, an, a Postgres application running on power and uh, vice versa. Which brings us to some very nice possibilities that we can have because there is no longer a, a, a lock-in. Exactly, there's no longer platform lock-in because Customers can now take a chance on the power platform because if it, the model doesn't work for them, then they can always go back to x86 and, and uh, their application will still work. But 
one of the things we're trying to promote in Atos is the idea of uh, using um, uh, an x86 as a cold standby for a power application. So we can have pa power squares running on power uh, right into the database. If, if the system fails or goes down, then uh, we can have that copy of the database files uh, across to an x86 server, or, uh, or and then the application can be retaken by uh, the application running on x86. Of course, and then when the power server comes back up again, we can fail back gracefully. Uh, oops. So for my I forgot my clicker, and so I'm now using my telephone for this. I'm just hoping nobody's going to give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, <coughs> uh, when you say x86, so it said earlier, now it could be the cloud, so we can actually run uh, Postgres databases on power and then have the backup server running on the cloud, in, on Amazon or on Google or any other third-party cloud server. And, and for the rest of the talk, all the things I'm talking about when I talk about x86, that's sort of in the slides, I'm talking about um, generic x86 platform in premises, but that could be equally the case where it could be off premises. Okay, and we have a demonstrator running. Uh, I'm setting this one up. The, the, the models that we have uh, in house work, Atos being a big company and a security conscious company, I'm having trouble getting the firewalls open to, to go and talk to between my database and, and Amazon. But this is the plan. We're going to have a, a demonstrate technology demonstrator showing exactly this stuff. But the problem with uh, the cold standby, of course, is that the recovery time and the recovery point, so the time it takes to restore the data, and uh, the point in time that we go back to when the database is restored uh, I is somewhat uh, problematic. And there's some better solutions for, for improving the recovery point and the recovery time. But before we go into that place, we need to understand a little bit about how Postgres uh, works uh, into the database. So uh, when Postgres is working, uh, it's very much very model, very similar to, po to Oracle. Uh, the before any transaction takes place onto the database itself, uh, the actual operation, how to do the operation, and above all, how to roll the operation back, the undo and the, re sorry, the redo and the undo, they get written into what's called the write ahead log, or the wall for people familiar with Postgres, which is exactly the same as the redo log in our Oracle. Once it's been saved in that space, the, the transaction is, is uh, committed in, into the database files themselves. And we use this write ahead log uh, for recovery. So if there's a crash uh, and transactions which have been started but not completed, committed or, or rolled back, we can, we can automatically roll, b roll them back when the database is, uh, is recovered. So when we're using a, a hot or a warm standby, the, the system works like this. The database is running and it's writing all its uh, transactions to the write ahead log and we have a, a, a mirror system which c could be uh, Ubuntu or Red Hat. It, it, it does actually work. I've actually done this between an, a Red Hat on power and an Ubuntu on x86, and this model still works. You don't actually need the same Linux operating system to get this to work. So I have my uh, x86 running on, on a distant remote server, and then using a, a typically SSL-based uh, transfer. This is all done automatically by the database. There are third-party solutions such as uh, Barman, which is a great name project. So this Barman is a, is a recovery manager uh, named after the R man in the Oracle world, which is done by uh, Second Quadrant. And uh, automatically Postgres will ship the right head logs uh, from the primary server to the backup server. They get put in into an archive and then automatically they get injected into the database. Uh, so the database is, is up to date. So these right head logs, they're typically between 16 and, and 64 gigabytes in size. So they take a certain amount of time to fill up. So if the database was to crash, we only recover to the latest, uh, the latest wall, which means that the recovery point is, is quite a long time back. The recovery time is quickly, but the recovery point is a, a little bit uh, old in history. So there's a second technique where we use the transaction stream, where, whereby uh, the transactions in progress are also sent across uh, SSL to the distant the backup server and this operation can be done either asynchronously or synchronously so if it's asynchronously w there is a risk when we recover that there will be a certain number of transactions lost but if it's synchronous uh, then there is no there is zero data loss between uh, the failure and the recovery and uh, this is a, a demonstrator we have uh, working in the lab in grenoble and this works really really great and we have a little uh, 
demonstrator works like this. Uh, so I have a, a power server running, uh, which is the primary, and uh, the, the x86 server is the backup, and I'm using the, the log chip and the transaction stream as the backup method. And I have a little PHP application running on, the, on a web server, and the, every five seconds, the, uh, the, the, the web server is going to make uh, an, an insert into the database uh, and on the primary side, and uh, it's going to do a read on, the, on, the sec on both, of both of them. Okay, so th one of the advantages of this approach is that the backup server can be used as a read-only database at the same time as the, as the primary server is used for, for transactions. Of course, you cannot commit transactions to the, to the backup database, otherwise we're, we're really in trouble. Because this is the model, and so I'm afraid this is a little bit technical. Uh, so you have to make a note of the of the the IP addresses on the, on the two servers because these come into play in a little bit how it works. So you can see the the power server is on the 192 subnet network and the, and the, and the x86 is on the TEB 10 subnet. Because this is the this is the transaction that we we run. Okay, so we run insert into the real time data the, the timestamp, the IP, and and a, and a value, a random value. Okay, so, and the values we put in, uh, the timestamp is now, this is an operating system uh, function, and the second operating s uh, d database function is the INET server address. So this takes this the IP address of the database server, as we saw, so the 197 and the 10, and in in inserts it into the row every five seconds, and then we stick a zero at the end. And then, okay, so this is the instruction. And so on the web server, this is what we see. Uh, we get the, time, the, the transaction ID, the timestamp, uh, the database IP, which is injected by the thing, and the value zero is just the value just to complete the table. So the, as we said, the, the, the we're writing onto the power. The, the, the requests are replicated onto the x86. The color coding is blue is the power, orange is the x86. And you can see very clearly that the, the two tables are coherent and uh, with the, the, rep the good copies. So when uh, I kill uh, the, the, the database, the Postgres server, uh, the data is still available on the backup. And still we can still read, but as you can see, at 19:44, I got a, I uh, killed this, the thing, and the the write ins the insert failed. Okay, the date so everything stopped uh, working on on the read. I can no longer write to the database. Okay, but I can then promote the backup server to become the primary server and the web application, which needs some smarts, will then start writing to the backup server because it now becomes now the primary. And as we can see, that we've we switched over to the ten-base subnet in the in the in instruction stream. So the, the whole thing works and is completely transparent to the well. It can be made transparent to the to the application end. So we can. This is one one possible way of working this work. And there's a second, slightly more advanced feature we can do, and this uses a, a technology called Postgres Excel, which is a technology uh, promoted by or developed by um, Second Quadrant, one of the major players in the Postgres world. And this is a sharded, uh, uh, clustered, shared nothing uh, extension for, for, Postgres, for Postgres. So this is an extremely simple model. Okay, uh, The details, are, as you can imagine, having a global transaction manager is, is quite involved. But this is that essentially we have a whole bunch of data nodes, and, and this can go, this can scale a long, long way. And you have this uh, Postgres Excel layer on top of it, and uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, th which manages uh, the co uh, coordination of the transaction and the coordination of the clients and uh, the global transaction manager, which manages the transactions I into the into the database. Of course, at the front end, there's, there's a load ba load balancer and and, uh, uh, and uh, a sort of HA proxy, which we'll need uh, to, to distribute the workload. Okay, and so this is the way it works. And what we can do here is because the data format I is absolutely identical, then we can uh, just automatically extend the, the existing uh, Postgres Excel cluster by inserting power nodes into the as, as a data node, and this just works. Yeah, this is something that really just works. Uh, and so we can bring a smooth transition to, to increasing the power using uh, power servers and of course because power we are everybody's pushing power here so this is where we want to get to you know it provides a really smooth transition <laughs> to get people off of uh, x86 and into power with a with a non-stop uh, no no disruption to the service uh, whatsoever and this is clearly where we're trying to trying to go
So why now? Now that we're we, we've we've um, we said you know we can do all this stuff. Why would anybody go to power? And this brings me to the second part of the, 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 the pitch, which is we've been doing a lot of work on, on Postgres benchmarks on, uh, on Power 9. And uh, I'd like to share those results with you, which are really hot off the press. I got the last results yesterday evening, so this <laughs> really is uh, last minute stuff. So we th we're using here is a PB bench, PG bench, which is a a benchmarking tool, a TPCB type uh, benchmarking tool. It's a relatively simple transactional workload, which comes bundled with uh, the Postgres database. Uh, so it's a transactional client, and everybody in the Postgres world uses this tool. Okay, we're, we're working on using uh, our next campaign is going to be TPC CPC H based, which is a decisional workload, and we're going to hopefully have some s nice numbers f in that in the short term. But for the time being, this is the ones I have for you. Uh, the the transaction. There are two modes of running this thing. There's a read-only and there's a read-write function. And the read-write uses uh, five, five uh, uh, SQL uh, queries with a select, update, and insert. And then there's a, there's a read-only option, which just uses select on the tables. And uh, we can multiply, multi uh, utilize multiple clients. I'm afraid I have to get into more of the details here a little bit, but uh, they have this thing called the scaling factor. So this is the size of the, this is the, the database tables. There are, there are just four tables. Uh, the branches, the tellers, the accounts, and the, and the history. So this is obviously a banking application. Uh, there's one, and by default, this is the, the scale of one. And so there is one branch. Uh, there are ten tellers in the branch, and there are hundred thousand accounts. And th the history is just the log of the, up the transactions that we've uh, committed to the database. But nobody runs this database uh, on scale factor one because it's just too small today. Uh, these are the more typical numbers, so we use a scale factor of 100, uh, and this just multiplies the number of lines in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the accounts table by the, the, the same scale. So a scale of 100 is 10 million lines, which is a 1.5 gigabyte database, uh, but t more typically we find 3,000 or 2,500. So we're looking at a 45 gigabyte database, which is mm, not huge, but it's starting to get a reasonably, reasonably sized database. Uh, this is the setup we have. Uh, this is using a, a Power9 power using Red Hat 7.5, uh, 14.4. Now, 14.4 is important if anybody's using deploying Red Hat. We had the uh, 4.14. We, we used an earlier version before, and uh, there was a huge performance gain uh, moving to 4.14. Uh, it was something like uh, 30 or 40 percent. It was it was a big big difference and. It wasn't the only change we made, but it's the only one that we can sort of think that uh, might explain the difference we, we got. So uh, you have to be very careful about the, the version you download from Red Hat. It's not obvious when you go to the Red Hat site to, to get the right version. So we have the injectors coming in, and then we have uh, two systems, two, two storage systems. I can use the, I have an EMC Unity 300 and, uh, or the, the, the in, in onboard NVMe. Okay, and in, in terms of the, the, the operations, it, they're very close in terms of performance. Uh, so we're running the, the bench scale of uh, 1,000 with, uh, well, use different scales so on the standard with the 15, and we're using the select only. So here's the picture from the EMC machine just to show how fast this stuff really runs. So I won't go into details here, but this is the, the, uh, <coughs> the bandwidth. And uh, during the database load, we completely saturated the N8 gigabit fiber channel. Uh, connection, uh, and so we've now gone to dual 16 gigabit uh, connection to the bay, <laughs> to the disk array, because uh, so here we are, hot off the press, uh, are the numbers we got. So this is a 14 core with 40 gigabytes of RAM, and we are around about 600, so for the scale of uh, 1,000, which we are at 600,000, six, 610,000 transactions per minute. Second, 610,000 transactions per second, which is just a, you know, it's a huge, huge number. This is a read-only, so we're not dependent on I.O. here. There's no I.O. Uh, everything is in memory, uh, which is, you know, 600,000. Uh, to me, that's a huge number, but let's see how it really compares. So I had a look around in the, in the publications, and the best, some of the best numbers I found, this one came from Enterprise DB. Uh, I'm afraid it's not a strictly an apples-to-apples apples comparison because they're using a, a slightly older version of the database. 
So this is uh, running on 60 cores, 60 Xeon cores, and with 512 gigabytes of RAM. So a way, way, way bigger configuration. And they reach 700,000. Uh, and so our ambition, just to be clear here, our ambition is to reach a million. Yeah, we, we're not there yet, but we, we want to get to the million. <laughs> but this is the best number we got from, on, from x86. The best one I could find, I'm not saying that is the best, but this is the best one I found uh, in the publications uh, on 60, core, 60 cores uh, with a Xeon. And then uh, IBM in Montpellier in the south of France worked with um, uh, Splendid Data to do a benchmark uh, on Power 8. And this is the numbers they got. So they they got uh, 420,000 uh, transactions per second. So this is on Power 8. And so this was Sebastian Chabrol. I don't know if he's actually quite well known inside IBM, uh, running with working with Splendid Data. And again, they had way more way more cores, and and they had uh, uh, much bigger RAM than we were putting into our system. But in truth, they don't need all that RAM. You know, even even the first one, they don't need 512 gigabytes of data to this. So Splendid Data is uh, a Belgian company uh, <coughs> who specialize in um, migrating Oracle databases to Postgres. They have a whole tool chain and a, and a methodology to do that, and, and, and Atos partners with uh, Splendid Data. They're similar to, uh, to uh, Enterprise DB. You know, Enterprise DB have this compatibility course here, so it's the idea of migrating from Oracle to Postgres. So if you bring this, so that back to my original question is why do we need to go? Why you know we're just running all this backup stuff and and, and scale out? Uh, why is power a good story here? And, and this is this for me is the really the, the case why it shows you. So if we look at the transactions per second per core, then uh, Intel we're around about eleven thousand. 11,000 transactions per second per core. The Sh Sebastian Chabrol on Power 8, they, they reached around 250,000 uh, transactions per second per core. And uh, on Power 9, we're uh, almost at, we're over 400,000. 40, sorry, 40,000. Uh, so we're a factor of four times better per core of this. And this the important thing here is that uh, all of these sort of middleware and any application software uh, suffer with scalability at high high levels of parallelism. Yeah, there's a there's the uh, who can help me? That there's the um, the parallelization effect. You can only parallelize a certain amount, and then the sequential part becomes dominant. I forgot the guy's name. Uh, doesn't Amdal? Thank you. Thank you very much. Amdal. The Amdal uh, law, which means that we can't. Uh, you know. When you get very high orders of, of uh, threading or parallelization, then uh, scalability starts to, to suffer. And so when the, the importance of the power per core really does come into, come into play here, and it's a big, big fact, factor. Okay, so it, and th this isn't, as I say, uh, an apples to apples comparison, strictly speaking, because this, the versions of the database aren't quite the same. Uh, but you can see that. Uh, in order to get these numbers, that, you know, very close numbers, we use just 14 cores. We use uh, just a quarter of the cores that uh, they needed on x86 in order to get this stuff to work. This was the read-write, just for, for completeness, this is the, the read-write uh, scale. So this is a read-write, we obviously much harder. And uh, so that we divide roughly by a factor of, of 10 in terms of the, the transactions per second. One of the things we cannot explain is we expect to see this curve come off the back at 128. I, I have absolutely no idea why this goes back up at 144. I don't know if there's a, there's a cash effect or something that something funky happens. Uh, this is a bit strange that needs a bit more investigating. And just uh, to show you the, the effect of, uh, of uh, SMT, because we can switch SMT8 and SMT4. Uh, on this processor, this is a, one of the bigger processors, not the ones we tend to get on the on the Linux on power servers, is that we get a, a, a comfortable 25% uh, performance increase moving to SMT8 to SMT4. And and just as a side note on SMT compared to uh, Intel's hyperthreading, there is a very clear difference between the SMT on power compared to hi Intel's hyperthreading. Intel's hyperthreading is simply a very rapid context switch. At any given time, there is only one thread running on the processor. On SMT on power, the the dispatch site, the dispatcher on the processor dispatches instructions from any of the active threads. 
Okay, so if it's got eight threads, it can dispatch uh, instructions from any of the eight threads during the dispatch. And so there really are uh, eight, uh, up to eight threads running in parallel on the processor. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, Atos, uh, that's me, uh, with our Escala platform, we rebrand IBM Power Systems as the Escala platform. Uh, that's our name for them. And our partner with Splendid Data, we really can make elephants fly because they can fly in, in the sense that we can, they go extremely fast and we can make them fly between x86 and, and, and power. Uh, we have a, I think we have a, a very convincing story here. And uh, so I think this is a sign that we've all been waiting for. You know, we really have to uh, get out there and, and start telling our customers that uh, power is a, is a viable alternative to x86 and uh, there is a lot of advantages using this platform. Some of the things I didn't ha really have time to get into in the, in the numbers is that uh, under extremely high loads, the, the response times that we get on power platform uh, are much less variable than the response times you get on x86. Yeah? The, the, the variability uh, of the response times is extremely stable on, on power compared to x86. You know, there, are, there are a lot of advantages uh, to go with this platform. I'd be happy to talk and to take any questions, uh, talk about offline with anybody for any, anything in particular. But that's it for me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.